Hello, everyone, and welcome to Designing for 3D Printing with Zverse and Shapeways. I am Rhonda Geet, Director of Marketing Communications for Shapeways. And today we have Steve and Caitlin, who are going to be talking about everything design oriented for 3D printing. Before we get started, I wanted to make a few housekeeping notes. If you have any questions, please put them in to the chat. If we do not get to your question, we will definitely follow up with you after. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our speakers. Steve and Caitlin, why don't you start? All right, um, I'm Caitlin Buckaloo. I'm head of our CAD as a service department here at Zverse. Um, I was brought on in 2019, originally doing a lot of project management and some design work. And now as head of CAD as, uh, I get to work with an incredible team of engineers and artists every day. And I'd say over the past year, year and a half, um, I've gotten to work a lot more closely with Steve and the awesome team at Shapeways. Uh, but I'm super glad to be here and excited to jump in. And I'm Steve Wirt, a director of customer success here at Shapeways. Uh, been in the ad of industry for about seven to eight years, but came to Shapeways about three years ago. And um, yes, I definitely uh, have had a huge impact from having Zverse a partner with us. Um, we were always missing that gap of design. So um, once this kind of partnership got established a couple of years ago, it's really taken off. So excited to kind of tell everybody about it today. I am on mute. So uh, we have a poll question of, uh, if you look to your right, there is a poll tab. And if you could take a moment to fill it out, that would be great. So my guess is going to be other, just because there's so many different things to design and 3D print for, you know? It is true. I only had five spots, so other <laughs> got the fifth spot. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, unless you have like a multiple choice of 20 options, even then you still might get other to be the top one. It's just there's too much, well, too I, many possibilities. I'm interested to see what people put in the chat for their other. We're getting a good amount of responses. I only have one response so far, and that's for engineering, weaving accessories. Oh, that's interesting. So great. Why everyone is putting this in the chat so that we can see what they designed for. Steve, why don't you talk a little about Shapeways? Um, so Shapeways, by the way, if you're not familiar, is um, a company that essentially makes 3D printing, which already is hard, it simplifies it. So we're a digital platform with, we have over a million customers. Uh, we printed over 20 million 3D printed parts. So just to give you an idea, we're, we're doing 8,000 parts a day. So, I mean, it's a tremendous operation. Uh, we have factories both in North America and Europe. Um, very, very large workforce. Uh, and 99% on-time delivery. So I think that's one of the things that, that really kind of makes us all stick out is not only are we able to do this at scale, but we're also able to deliver exactly what the customer needs. Um, and with that, I think this is kind of the best way to explain like why we partnered with Zverse. Um, believe it or not, um, we don't actually have an in-house design team. Um, Shapeways tried it years ago, brought in a couple experts, and they were fantastic. But we never realized the massive scope that is needed for design and how how much uh, intricacies really kind of fall into place. Um, as much as you think of just getting something to be able to print on a printer, there's a lot more, a lot more that comes into actually designing something and even bringing your idea or concept to life, even if it's just something like a basic cube, you know, to be able to bring that um, into kind of the 3D uh, in real life realm. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Caitlin. Awesome. Thanks. Oh, all right. Yeah. So um, to all of our listeners, um, you know, Steve and Rhonda came to me and said, we'd love to have Zverse on to discuss designing for 3D printing. And 
the very first question I had was, well, where where the heck do we begin? Because you can get down, you can go down so many rabbit holes um, with all the different areas in the 3D world. And so I decided to start out with this slide. I think it does a really good job of illustrating exactly where Zverse fits in the additive manufacturing journey. Um, and so to, to back up a step and give everyone a little bit of background about Zverse, we started back in 2013 when our CEO and founder, John Carrington, uh, his daughter came home with a, a drawing of an Easter egg and he wanted to turn that into a 3D model for her to hold in her hands. And so if we were to say he was coming down this pipeline on the left um, and he went to a bunch of 3D manufacturers, he quickly found that most of these manufacturers would have a file upload section and they'd say upload your file and we'll give you a price for your model to be printed. And so if he were to try and just share an image of that Easter egg, there wasn't any sort of geo like volume associated with that. And so 3D printing companies wouldn't be able to, to determine how much that would cost. And so typically what, what they would say is, hey, come back when you have a 3D file. Um, and so Zverse, this kind of, um, this gap was, was something that John thought, hey, we can definitely create a solution here and ended up building a network of designers and 3D modelers uh, to quickly turn customers 2D drawings uh, into 3D models. And so that's kind of where we fit in over here on the left and so, or on the right. And so with Shapeways, it's actually a really great relationship. So they don't have to turn people away and say, come back when you have that file. Um, they can quickly say, we have a partner here, um, a ton of design engineers who know how to design for 3D printing, who uh, can get, get that file done for you and you can come back for printing question. Again, if you go to the poll section, you can take a moment to answer what your thought is. Now, Caitlin, how many design engineers are actually at Zverse? Um, so in-house, we have a, a handful. I think we have five total in-house, and these are uh, varying. We have a couple of interns who are actually taking classes at the University of South Carolina, doing um, mechanical engineering. And so they have some CAD experience there. And then we also have a couple of designers who have been designing, modeling for years. Um, and so we have five in-house and then our network, we have about 40, 40 engineers and, there are, and artists and they're all over the world. So. We have our US based designers and then also um, there's actually we have one I want to say he's like 16 or 17 in the Netherlands and his his work is so incredible. And so, um, yeah, oh, wow. but we're always we're always trying to grow that network. Caitlin, it looks like most people think that it is more expensive to design for 3D printing than to print itself. Would you like to comment on that? Interesting. Okay. Well, um, I'm sorry, but the answer was false. Um, so for example, there, I like to describe it as kind of a, a teetering, like there are two main factors that will affect the, the design costs and then the printing costs. So for design, the more complex your geometry is, the more expensive that it's going to be because in terms of if I put it in terms of like painting, you know, say someone just wants one wall painted red, someone would do that for a very cheap cost compared to if they wanted a mural of, um, you know, starry night painted, that's going to take a lot more time. Whereas with 3D printing, um, while the complexity can be very, very crazy, um, if it's really small, it can still be a really cheap print. However, if I'm printing a, a huge cube, uh, that's going to be a lot of material that you're going to have to pay for. And the print bed space, if you think of it in terms of um, like real estate, you know, that's a, a bunch of other 
products that aren't going to be printed that day because of that, that large print. Does that make sense? For all of our audience members, as we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat and we will answer them as we go. Okay, so I'm about to talk for uh, a minute and so please feel free to stop me or if any questions come up. Um, but I just want to go ahead and give all of our listeners a quick overview of, of what our design workflow looks like. Um, so this slide just illustrates step by step from the start, once a customer is referred by Shapeways over to the Zverse uh, portal, they will submit all of these answers through an intake form just to go ahead and give our team a, a better understanding of what they're looking to have modeled. Um, and so once that's submitted, our team of project managers will reach out to the customer, you know, thank you for, for coming to us. And if there's enough information provided, then we'll be able to put together a design quote based on the amount of time that it's going to take to model that. Um, however, sometimes there isn't enough um, information or it can be interpreted all different types of ways. And so it's our project manager's responsibility to gather all that information in order to get an accurate quote for that final model to be designed. So from there, the customer, uh, once they approve and pay that quote, then we'll go ahead and choose the best designer for that geometry. Um, the designer will model it. And then once we have a file ready for the customer to review, we'll send it to them and also run it through Shapeways printability um, analysis tool to make sure that it's printable. Um, and this is kind of an iterative cycle, usually. Um, sometimes the customer is like, that is perfect, let me go to printing now. Or other times they'll say, can you tweak this, this part here and there? And we'll just go back to the designer and get that new model. And so then finally, once it's done, we refer them back to Shapeways and they're able to claim the model and get a print quote in the material and quantity that they're wanting. So digging a little deeper into that process, that sounded very um, quick, but usually there's a lot more to it on the, on the back end for our project managers. Um, essentially what we're trying to figure out is in the long run, what type of CAD software your geometry is gonna be designed in. And so um, to put it in layman's terms, it's usually art versus part. And so part are these parametric designs, which are done usually in software like SolidWorks or Creo or Katia. Um, and these are the more rigid boxier designs where the customer is gonna provide every dimension for every feature because it's critical to fit with some other uh, component usually. And then on the other hand, the mesh design, which is more artsy, these are your more organic free form models where um, the designer has a little more freedom to manipulate geometries, um, but the customer is usually focused on like aesthetic and proportions. Um, and so with that, um, I would say, you know, for example, if someone wanted me to design a sculpture for them, that would take me easily over a year to do in Creo. Um, whereas we have a number of designers who could knock that out within a couple of weeks within their mesh modeling software. All right. So then the other type of um, category that we like to determine before quoting customers, um, not only what type of software it's gonna need to be modeled in, but also the, the skill set or level of expertise and the duration that this project is gonna be. And so I'll jump into each of these individually. So one-off designs, this is not a um, term used in the industry. I just made this up uh, based on my experience with projects. Um, these are more of your artwork display pieces where it's not gonna require a lot of um, like once that final model is done, the customer is usually going to produce one or 50 or 100 of these and not ask for tweaks every every couple of weeks. Um, and so, for example, these, 
these customized jewelry pieces, um, statues and busts for memorials, um, architectural models, dioramas, awards, trophies, marketing material, those types of things. Um, and I will say branding irons are getting very, very popular now. I don't know, Steve, have, have you guys seen a lot come through the production Oh yeah, absolutely. Queue? I mean, branding irons are really exciting too. Um, and I think the one-off design, I think that these are like a lot of times what sparks the creativity, right? So a lot of times we've seen um, people kind of start working with Shapeways more and more because they come to us, they want to solve an issue. They got a, they got a problem they want to solve it, whether it's an artistic, a trophy, or actually something they're trying to create around the house or something else. And then that actually gets a lot of people into 3D printing. So it's fun. It's, it's really exciting to see this stuff because it's kind of the door opener, right? It's the way it brings people in. Um, uh, so definitely, although from a business perspective, they don't always come back to the same design, it could actually be a whole other project that kind of segues into some of the other stuff you're about to talk about. Right. That's And, and for example, I have a uh, bachelorette party coming up, and I was able to quickly make customized uh little prints for all of my all of my girls come in and so this was this is actually hopefully they don't come back with all kinds of changes for me to make for my pad software um okay and so and and just to mention like one-off designs and then what i'm about to talk about here 2d to 3d conversions these are usually um pretty straightforward there's not much room for uncertainty um, on the designer's end. And so we can usually knock these out within a couple of days. Um, 2D engineering drawings, these, these usually look like this, what I'm showing here on the left, where there's multiple views with the dimensions called out. Um, the only time where there's uncertainty is if, say, there's a ton of dimensions missing or um, the drawing isn't to scale or in very rare situations, the drawing is very old and has been scanned 20 times, and we just can't read anything on it, um, which has happened a few times. But in, in those situations, our alternative solution is, hey, we can use our best judgment from this drawing, or if you have the actual part, we can scan it for you. All right, and then prototype design. This is like, I think what what 3D printing has really just been utilized so much for, and it's made just such a huge impact on the speed to market for so many new inventors. Um, but this is more of where people are just testing the, the concept and the feasibility of their product um, function fit. It's, it's a, usually a really iterative process. And then reverse engineering and scanning, these two terms are used interchangeably a lot. Um, usually we, we can tell right off the bat whether a customer is needing a scan or if they're gonna be okay with caliper measurements. Um, so for example, we had one guy, he, he was local to the area and he came to us with a little gear for his kid's music box. And he said, this thing has broken in half and I've super glued it 20 times and the glue just isn't holding up anymore. And I, I really would like to replace it so we can keep it in the family. And so he was like, can you scan it? And I said, well, do you want it scanned with all of that glue showing or would you be okay with us taking some calipers to it and reverse engineering it? And so he was fine with the caliper measurements and, and it ended up working just like that. Yeah. And so, but in other, oh, sorry, I'm just saying, ahead. like, I think this is like another piece of 3D printing that people don't see, you know, that, that's done all the time. You see it a lot of times with like plastic cars being brought back to life from like different parts on like kind of the, the, the manufacturing level. Um, you know, you have a picture, uh, picture right here of an Egyptian bus. Like, you know, we're, these are things that are amazing that we could show, whether it's in the Smithsonian, whether it's in like major museums, to bring stuff to life that normally people would never be able to touch or interact with because it's also falling apart. So um, for me, uh, kind of being a history buff as well, like this is I think one of the, the parts of 3D printing that people don't talk about a lot, right? That, that you can actually, it doesn't always have to be a new idea. Sometimes old is the new idea of bringing something back. So um, yeah, again, just another really, really exciting part of uh, kind of what Zebras can do um, in, their, in their toolkit. 
Right. Yeah, we did. We did have one project um, a couple of months ago, and this gentleman came to us with an old family signet ring. And um, I don't know if he wanted to 3D print replicas for his children or something, uh, or whether it was his grandpa's from, uh, you know, decades ago or, or what have you. But he said that he really wanted to capture all of the little scratches and nicks that were in it. Um, and so I told him, you know, scanning is definitely a great solution, but also our modelers, if you give us enough reference Im images, like we can, we can design them in there. So yeah, moving on, we have product development and fix a file. So I put these on the same slide because these projects are usually, um, we can't usually determine how long the project is gonna take at first glance. This, this always requires us to dig a little deeper with the whole design team figure out exactly what the customer is needing done. Um, and so for product development, it, there's a lot of overlap with the prototyping type of projects. Um, and usually this is where a customer has already validated their market and they're ready to start mass producing or they just need to start making a ton of these and they wanna minimize their production costs. Um, fix a file on the other hand can be, it's all over the map, you know, Sometimes people will come to us with something like this figurine on the right hand side of the screen and there are just a few features that aren't going to print successfully. And so our designers can quickly thicken those for you, give them back, and then you can get a print with Shapeways. On the other side, um, on the whole other side of the 3D world, um, there are 3D models that we, we think just aren't meant to come off of a screen, essentially. And so these are usually your gaming assets, or if you've ever watched HGTV, the rendering software to show you what your new kitchen is gonna look like. Usually if you try to export those, it's gonna be a, a bunch of surfaces without a, a volume. And so I included this little owl image. This, this model, um, this customer came to us and they said, just make it printable. I'm ready to print. And I said, well, we can go in and try to connect all of those surfaces and make it a watertight mesh. However, that will take probably even longer than just redesigning it from scratch. And so if I remember correctly, the designer that I showed this to was like, I could maybe salvage the feet, but I think we're just better off uh, designing this from scratch in a separate window. Students of some of the examples that you were sharing, a question came in about that. So we do, I do not offhand, um, and we, we don't have a structured pricing, uh, you know, for whatever type of project it is, mainly because every geometry is different and every request we don't want to sometimes people will come to us with a reference file of something that's way more complex than what they're actually wanting and we don't want to mislead them and give them an inaccurate quote and so we we take things on project by project and work with our designers to see um how low is there get that cost a difference in with cost a quality design in the, in the end goal like if they're if you're designing for one material versus another. I mean, I, I think I could take that here because that kind of comes into the shapeways realm. But yeah, there's absolutely a cost difference. So, for instance, you can take two things that are very very similar. So let's use an example of like sandstone or mamaki. Um, both are great, um, like full color options but both are gonna have significant differences um, from both from just how they look to actually how they feel. Obviously sandstone's gonna feel more sand-like, you know, versus where uh, the poly jet's gonna feel like more of like a smooth surface. Um, and those are gonna have a significant uh, price differences. So um, yeah, it's really gonna depend. Um, also even how the model's designed is, you know, how much volume in is, is part of it and everything else. So. Um, there's really never going to be a apples to apples comparison, whether you're in 3D design or in, in, in 3D printability. It's really going to always be an apples to oranges. So the nice thing is, is each project, whether from the design or from the printing phase, is like a snowflake. 
They're all unique. They're all different. Um, but we're always here to help you from, you know, any from the Zverse or the Shapeways team. We'll walk you through it and really get you to what you need. Actual property rights for the model. If the idea is by the customer, but the model is designed by Zverse. So that that is a great question, um, and and we get that quite a bit. So as soon as our file is handed off, uh, the customer then owns the asset. Um, I will say, if a customer comes to us with a Mickey Mouse uh, image and says, "Turn this into 3D for me," we we will say, "Hey, once you have approval from Disney." to create this, then we're happy to, but I, I don't think that that will, will happen. We're going through, I'm reading through the questions, but I think that we can go on for the moment and Any answer a question with another. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I thought it'd be good to include, so that was my whole spiel on the different types of projects that we see and, and how we kind of categorize them. Um, but for 3D printing, just how much the industry has has impacted manufacturing as a whole. Um, you know, it, everyone knows it, it's significantly increased the prototyping speed. Um, there's, there's way more design freedom compared to your traditional manufacturing processes. Um, not having to worry about undercuts and drafts and all, all of that fun stuff. Um, minimizing material usage. So um, rather than subtractive manufacturing where you're cutting away from a block of material, you're able to just build with the necessary material um, and minimize the amount of waste. Um, and in fact, I think water soluble support material is, is getting more and more popular. So supports are, are sometimes considered waste if they can't be like melted back down. Um, but I, I am amazed by that. And um, also creating custom designs and high detail replications, um, going back to the scanning abilities. Um, and then the, the same gist down at the bottom of when to utilize 3D printing. Steve, I think the coolest you one that I've seen, one? and it, it seems to be becoming more and more prevalent as just really kind of science uh, catches up with nature. And what I mean by this is, is nature has some pretty amazing organic geometries that we don't really see all the time. And, um, you know, there, there's companies out there that are starting to see this and that you're actually seeing it a lot in like uh, different things with mesh. Um, so when you were talking about like some of the mesh designs, you're seeing that from like helmets are now using mesh designs integrated in, which by the way, a lot of this is actually replicated in nature. So if you see some of like the advanced geometries of coral reefs um, or, you know, even like a sponge or anything else, you're starting to realize that structurally um, nature's already figured it out. And the thing about with 3D printing, it actually can print that stuff very easily versus you take this to your traditional molding or injection molding and everything else, it's incredibly hard. And you're actually gonna spend more money and time trying to develop it where if you just can throw it on a 3D printer, you're able to create these amazing products really fast. So um, just something that, that I've started to see more and more, but is, is mind blowing to me, uh, which is really fun to see. Right, right. Yeah. And the cost efficiencies, I mean, we, we tell people, I mean, I think a lot of customers have just heard of injection molding and they're like, this is what I need to do. And I'm like, well, if you're only making one or two of these, you don't need to pay $50,000 for a, a steel tool. Uh, uh, one of the listeners has a pair of earrings like they printed beautifully parts. in hard plastic. But when they went to print it in gold, the detail was too fine. Can you give an example of a cost-effective way to fix this file so that they can get the detail in the material that they would like? So the detail I was think that is too, what did the asking. detail did it lose detail when switching from plastic to metal? Is that 
Did you? Yeah, so that's actually a really common um, hiccup that a lot of our customers experience. Um, you know, you're kind of limited to what the corresponding printing technology is able to achieve. Um, so going back to what Steve was saying about Mimaki versus Sandstone, um, you know, the print nozzles or, or the whatever is able to achieve way finer detail on the Mimaki than the Sandstone. And, and you'll notice that with a lot of different print processes. And I would, I would say that your resin plastic um, those types of printers are able to achieve really, really fine details, um, whereas metal is still still advancing and, and catching up to, to those And we have our last poll question for the day. So if you go back to the poll tab and answer this question, that would be great. If it goes, there we go. I'm very interested in seeing what people pick. We also have another in this category too, because I only have five spots. So if you do select other, please put it into the chat so that we can can hear what you think is very cool with up and coming 3D printing. 3D printed homes is an I, I yeah yeah that's, a, that's yes. an exciting one that um, is I very... think it's only going to continue to get exciting I know you have seen some companies that are getting some pretty large rounds of funding recently because these houses um, you know all, are probably uh, going to help out with this whole housing market issue that we're dealing with across uh, really not only the US but across the world um, is just lack of housing and especially I think the pandemic all made us realize that we kind of want to have a nice home so uh, I'd agree with that. That's a really exciting, really exciting. We also uh, have three D printed world. food and using moon dust as a printable material. Yeah, yeah. I actually saw that NASA yeah. is okay. starting to three D print moon from moon from dust here, but it looks so that they like don't have to ship all those materials up. Pretty much for open source CAD programs and production level 3D printed parts. Yeah, both of those are, are definitely desirable. <laughs> I know the, the carbon 3D printer can achieve the, those production level 3D printed parts um, and have started to replace a lot of metal um, legacy parts. All right, so um, the rest of, of the, or these next few slides are really just to show our audience, you know, the, the types of requests that we've seen with the limited reference material and just show you that whatever you come to us with, um, as long as we have a visual reference and a, a description, we can, we can knock something out for you. And so this one specifically, uh, the customer came to us with these four images on the left, and he said, I just do something using these, this type of geometry, but a simplified version. And so our designer had a lot of freedom um, to come up with something simple. And I don't know if they were game board pieces or what, but um, the customer sent us a few pictures of how it turned out. Next, uh, this Texas screwdriver. So the customer came to us with these two images on the left, and all we needed to confirm was uh, if he had a specific screw thread type that he wanted to use or size, and then we knocked out the, the rest of the design for him. Yeah, but exactly. Steve, I, I think, mean, said this is family, the most Texas you know, thing Texas, he's ever the seen. Most Texas thing I've ever seen, but it, it pretty much means like, if you don't got that Texas screwdriver, you're not taking that dresser apart again. It's it's staying in one piece. It's not going anywhere. But I do. I love it. I'm not going to lie. I, I think this is fantastic. So just say this is more of one of those fun, cool things that 3D printing can do. Maybe not super practical, but definitely just fun. Just a fun. 
answer this one. What type of projects do you see most yeah. commonly? <laughs> um, so I, th I think it's gonna, the, that's actually kind of a hard question to answer. And I think both Caitlin and I are gonna have different ones. Um, I would say I'd see what usually comes to Shapeways is, is gonna be two different types of customers. You're gonna have the one-offs, so kind of like what Caitlin was talking about when, you know, people just getting into 3D printing, just figuring out and everything else. And then the other thing we have is more like production partners, I'd say, is the two different types of projects we have. And the production partner is definitely going to be more of somebody who is either doing low volume, meaning like they don't need to make a thousand and go to injection molding or anything else, or they're doing customized projects. So they're doing something that's a lot of that's a lot of uh, products but they're all customized to an individual or customized to a different type of device segment or anything else. So I'd say those are the, probably the two most common things we're seeing, but that's just on the Shapeways print, you know, printing side. And I'll have to diverge to, to Caitlin on the design side. Right, I think so. I think it can be answered in two ways, like the types of requests that we get versus the ones that actually proceed to 3D printing. Um, so we do get a ton of miniature uh, diorama type requests. And I think customers um, might rethink whether or not they want to proceed just because it's essentially we're re-sculpting that geometry when they think it'll be the same cost as um, something you purchase off the shelf. So a small, little World War II figurine might cost, um, you know, significantly more than the $10 that it would cost to purchase off of Amazon or from from a, a, a regular supplier like Walmart or something like that. Um, but I would say a lot of jewelry, uh, we see a lot of jewelry, a lot of, of crazy uh, inventions. And then just we have new, another question on new what's the entrepreneurs strangest or inventors coming received? up with all kinds of crazy inventions. Um, um, I'm under NDA for one of them, which uh, <laughs> is really crazy. Um, but another one that, that our designer has, has devoted oh. tons of hours to are um, dog urns that the head screws off and uh, so they're in the shape of the dog who, who passed. And then oh. when you close it, it locks permanently so that you know, children running around can reopen it. Um, so I'd say that's the strangest. <laughs> okay, um, just a couple of more really cool projects. Um, the Shanghai Tower was, was an awesome architectural project. It was designed in nine different pieces and then um, printed to fit within his awesome display of skyscrapers. Um, this miniature cow was a fix a file project. It, to show you for scale, it, it, it's super tiny and we uh, just had to thicken a few areas here shown in red. And then this Roman statue ear cuff was, was a really fun one. So the, the customer came to us with this ear cuff picture and then just told us, hey, you can find pictures of this statue all, all, all over Google. And so the designer was able to work with that reference information and, and present a, a really incredible design. Um, and she included these holes for feathers to fit in as well. Then the famous sticky note project. I think this is uh, this goes back to our first or second question that we asked of whether designing would cost more than printing. So this was a super simple geometry, I'd say. Uh, it was a he came to us with a sticky note and said, I need to invert this for my speaker to be mounted to, and I need these four holes added into the model. And it ended up being like $14,000 to print in metal. And I thought that was that was outrageous, but it just goes to show um, oh, yeah. people are willing to 3D print any, anything. 
And then finally, our Lowe's trade show design and print project. Uh, the customer just said, I need all of these models in at five or six inches in height and I'm gonna print them to show at our, at our trade show in Vegas. And finally, moving on to the 3D printing side yeah. of things. Yeah, so I kind of touched um, on this earlier. Steve, so did you wanna start two really start on good examples one? of full color 3D printing. Now, by the way, the glasses you can see here, this is a prototype. So as much as like fun they look like to throw on your face and wear them, you know, we don't suggest that, unfortunately, because they need to, you know, be specially coded and actually ready for production to be able to wear. However, again, this goes back into prototyping and what you can do and what you can and kind of create. Um, these are two different um, technologies. So one is actually using sand and a binding jetting solution and actually creating that and creating figures where HD full color Mamaki is using actually more of a plastic to do it. Um, price points are very different. So, you know, sandstones, you're going to be able to get a little bit more economically. So if you're looking to do something that maybe you just want to put on a shelf, it doesn't get touched, it doesn't get moved, might be a really good solution for you. Where Mamaki is going to be a little bit more durable, but it is going to be more expensive. And then you do have a little bit of abilities with Mamaki. You can actually play around with transparency. So like, for instance, if you wanted to create something that actually has some kind of transparent feel to it, you'd be able to do that um, using the HD full color Mamaki. So both of these solutions, by the way, are available at Shapeways. So really the best thing is, is once you get your design done with Zverse, absolutely work with one of the uh, team members There's at Shapeways. And we can question, go ahead and uh, figure out which, which, which I'm interested is going to work in. best for your project. Is there so. a way to print the lens with 3D printed, 3D printing? Um, so I'll answer this one too. Yes, but let's be honest, it's not going to be the best thing to see through. It's, it's, it's actually going to be really hard. It's going to look like your, um, your vision deteriorated. Uh, you know, it's not going to be something that you're going to want to actually use. Um, but again, if it's for a prototype and you're going into a big presentation and you want to show your brand new um, eyewear creation that you've created and you want to have a functional prototype, go for it. I mean, that, that would be able to kind of bring the whole concept together. Uh, but yeah, the best thing to do is go with glass. It's, it's designed uh, to be able to, you know, be shaped a certain way. So it creates that the magnification you enough... need oh, or lack thereof, but it's also going to be very transparent to be able to see through. So. Yes. We... I was just going to say, we Maybe don't have any it. eye doctors on our uh, we have design another question. network just How yet. Much so work are you I don't know that you'd want us to design props. what you're going to be seeing through all day. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have done a few uh, different movie prop designs. It, it really comes down to the size and um, because sometimes people will want like large, large props printed and um, usually they're, they're not working with that kind of budget. But sometimes it's, it's actually gotten a lot more popular for costume design. So usually once Halloween rolls around, we get a lot of custom requests. Um, and then also I, I think we've started to see more like pr prosthetic uh, yeah. 3D I will say uh, many, for, many moons ago, um, Shapeways actually did a dagger for a show called Game of Thrones. If you guys have ever heard of it, um, this was, again, um, I think almost seven, eight years ago, but definitely some amazing, amazing. It was actually used in the show. Um, so, no, it's it definitely used before. But kind of like Caitlin said, it's a little bit more of a one-off perspective, and it has to make sense. Right. It has to actually make sense that, that it's going to be done in the 3D printing perspective and everything else. Um, you know, uh, movie props have been around for way, way, way before 3D printing has ever been uh, created. So there's some really, really creative people out there that know how to do some different stuff. But if it's a perfect fit, um, we definitely have done stuff that, that makes that for, for movie props. That's awesome. I didn't know that about Game of like Thrones. It. I'm a I'm a big fan. My my cat's name is Hodor. So <laughs> finishing options. Okay. okay. So guys, and by then, the way, so... hot off the press. If you're in this webinar, you're hearing about a brand new finishing op option here with Shapeways. So now we're gonna actually have a premium option for our plastic. 
what does this mean? So it pretty much means that now you can get a production grade, like traditional manufacturing kind of feel to your parts. Beforehand, we've done a lot of stuff with um, tumbling and different kinds of aspects to get it to that point where it looks really good. Well, now we're actually integrating a vapor smooth. Um, what does that mean? It just means that now we're using an actual chemical to actually smooth out the part. So you're going to have it where uh, the granularity is almost non-existent. Um, so again, really kind of taking it to where we're looking to get more and more end use parts created, um, brand new to Shapeway. So if you want to go ahead and check it out today. I have a question. Um, does that <sighs> And you know this better than me. It's based all? on the geometry, right? So like, you know, uh, yeah, it could be, but again, it, it's really going to be based on the part, how it's created, how it's designed and all that. So um, definitely work with a Shapeways expert if you, if you want to find out more about that, because it could, right? Because what you're doing is you're actually um, kind of uh, evening out the, the layer lines that typically you saw, see with any kind of 3D printing technology. So it's going to um, possibly, but again, I can't speak to say yes, because somebody's going to have a crazy geometry that actually maybe it diminishes it. So, um, you know, everything's like a snowflake, but we can definitely Home decor help you get that accessories and projects. And could you give some examples? Okay. Cool. Yes. Um, we have done quite a bit of home decor. Uh, usually those are the like desktop items or display pieces or gifts to, to family or coworkers. Um, we've done some lamp shades or lamp based designs. Um, and then a ton of culinary new kitchen appliance. Yeah. I will actually say designs home decor, well. especially, um, you know, if you're just wanting to try stuff out and play around, I'll take you back to 2014 when I first got into 3D printing got my first 3D printer and I was in a New York apartment and I had nothing. And I found out real quick, a lot of things you can 3D print real quick. So whether it was coat hooks, um, door stoppers, a ladle rest for your kitchen, um, a pen holder, a Apple Watch um, spot, so you can charge your Apple Watch on top of a thing. You don't really realize how much you need until you don't have it, but all of a sudden you have a tool to create. Um, so I'd say home decor, the really only thing you got to worry about and, and avoid with home decor is anything that's going to be food safe. So remember, if you're doing anything that's food safe related, um, you got to go through a bunch of different things. So whether it's how it's 3D printed, how it's coded afterwards and everything else. So as long as you're avoiding that, just to make sure you're being completely um, safe, um, you're good. And you can really, really do some some, some fun stuff. Yes, um, and I will chime in. There decor, is a really case kind of study on the Shapeways website about but, a six-foot uh, vanity a in a bathroom that. for a luxury home that uh, was printed with Shapeways and then sealed so it is waterproof. So definitely check it out. Yeah, we have done a lot of architectural, uh, like, I don't know the correct names for them, but corbels and aprons of just to, to help architects really envision their their work yeah. before. One final thing, to too, is like we do have a ton uh, of different colors production. in versatile plastic that probably a lot of people don't realize. And some of those are actually all displayed down here with one of our um, big customers, Baron Brew. So if you're ever trying to get just one solid color and different products, definitely work with the Shapeways team. We can figure out what that's going to look like. So, um, by the way, if you want more of like a color matching perspective, I would go more to the sandstone or mamaki um, route. But again, if you're just looking for a generic color, we have that available in the VP as well. So. I love this meme. Yeah. All right. And <laughs> yeah, I saw it on LinkedIn the other day and thought it'd be a good way to close out the, the presentation. And so essentially just noting that design will come first uh, if you're trying to get 3D printed. Another question. 3D printed. And Julie, so, how hard uh, is all it we to need is a, a visual reference like and, and uh, watch approximate things. dimensions. That's all I got.
So it's not necessarily hard to design. Um, I mean, sometimes you see chains with specific geometries so that they overlap really nicely. And, and we can certainly design that. Uh, a lot of the time though, um, like sometimes people will come to us with a new necklace design and we'll usually just point out that the chain is probably gonna be a lot less expensive and it'll be the more cost efficient route to purchase it off the shelf and only have that pendant 3D printed. Um, I'm not really sure what the, what the cost difference looks like, but we, we have pointed that out to customers in the past. Uh, that was the other question. Is we have, we did, we did have one business card design and it was, uh, the name was, or the details were engraved in. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how many of them they printed. Okay. Well, I think that is all. We did have a few questions that well, it, it depends. a more in-depth uh, answers. It's just money. So we'll follow up with those listeners after the webinar so that we can give you a little more detail and find out a little more about your project to help answer your question. Steve and Caitlin, I want to thank you so much. This has been really great. And thank you for everyone who has joined and listened. Uh, we're very excited to have you here. And Caitlin, we always love working with you and Zoopers. Thanks. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, you too. All right, everyone have a good one.